just going to wait another minute and then I'm going to announce our presenter. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to get started. So uh, here we have Professor Paul Finkelman, the president of Gratz College, is the author of more than uh, 200 scholar articles and more than 50 books. He is a specialist on American constitutional and legal history, the American Civil War, and religious liberty and the history of religion in the US, American Jewish history, slavery, civil rights, and race relations and African-American history. The United States uh, Supreme Court has quoted and cited his work in five decisions as have numerous other federal and state courts. Thank you for joining us today, uh, Professor Finkelman, and the floor is yours. It's a pleasure to be here. Can you all hear me okay? Am I, am I coming through loud and clear? So uh, today I wanna talk about my recent book, um, Supreme Injustice, which is a study of how the Supreme Court dealt with slavery. Uh, I wanna say a little bit about how a book like this gets written. I um, was asked to give some lectures at Harvard University uh, some years ago on some topic dealing with African-American history as part of the W.E.B. Du Bois Center at Harvard. And since I'm a constitutional and legal historian, I thought that it would be interesting to talk about the way the Supreme Court dealt with slavery. I had to give three lectures, so I focused on the three most important judges leading up to the Civil War, who were uh, Chief Justice John Marshall, uh, Joseph Story, and then at the end, Chief Justice Roger Tawney. Um, it was easy to write and to lecture on Marshall, uh, on Story and on Tawney. Uh, Story was from Massachusetts. He came to the court as a man who was opposed to slavery. He never owned a slave in his life. But gradually, during his years on the court, his jurisprudence changed so that when he first came to the court, he wrote decisions in which he condemned slavery, uh, described the immorality of slavery, and argued that, that the court should do everything possible to hem in slavery wherever possible, understanding, as everybody did at the time, that slavery was written into the US Constitution in a variety of ways, and you could not um, get away from slavery. Uh, slavery was there. But Story thought that laws, for example, prohibiting the African slave trade should be strictly enforced, and this would help end the illegal importation of slavery. So, uh, the importation of slaves had been banned in 1808. However, by the end of his career, uh, sadly, Justice Story had become uh, a tool of the slave owners. And his most important decision on slavery, his last decision called Prigg versus Pennsylvania, Story basically said that a slave owner had a right to capture a fugitive slave anywhere that a slave owner found that slave without necessarily bringing that person before a judge. And so this would have created all kinds of possibilities for kidnapping because any Southerner could go to Southern Pennsylvania, grab a free black person and say, this is my slave. I'm taking the person back to the South. Um, 
Story did this because he felt it was necessary to preserve the Union, although the Union was not, in 1842, uh, likely to come apart. Uh, I think Story mo mostly did this because for him, uh, black lives did not matter. Uh, black freedom did not matter. He was not concerned about these things. Although he considered slavery an abomination, he didn't think that whether a free black was kidnapped in Pennsylvania mattered in the long run to the stability of the United States. Chief Justice Taney was, of course, easier to write about because he is the man who wrote the Dred Scott decision. And that is generally considered to be among the absolute worst decisions ever given by a Supreme Court justice. In Dred Scott, Taney says that black people have no rights, that whites need to be res just respect. He says that blacks can never be citizens of the United States, uh, even if they're free. Uh, this is an odd kind of result because by the time uh, Tawney wrote this decision in 1857, blacks could vote in a half a dozen states. Blacks voted for members of Congress, blacks voted for governors, blacks voted for presidential electors. We've just had a presidential election. Uh, there are people who worry about non-citizens voting in presidential elections, but Chief Justice Tawney said that a black in Massachusetts or a black in New York or a black in Rhode Island or New Hampshire or Maine or Vermont could vote in a presidential election, vote for a presidential elector, vote for a member of the House of Representatives, even though Tawney said these people can never be citizens of the United States, even if they're born in the United States. Uh, Dred Scott helped push the nation to civil war, not because Southerners didn't like the opinion, Southerners loved the opinion, but Dred Scott set the stage for Abraham Lincoln uh, being elected president in 1860, and that led to secession because Southerners could not abide by the notion that there was a president who had said that he thought slavery should ultimately be uh, abolished. Uh, Lincoln had said that slavery should put on, be put on the road of ultimate extinction, and this was enough for Southerners to leave the United States. If any of you think that secession was about states' rights, if you think it was about a northern industrial society oppressing a southern agrarian society, go look at the documents produced by the secession conventions. The South Carolina legislature says, I'm sorry, the South Carolina secession convention says we are seceding because a man has been elected president who believes that slavery should be ultimately on a road to extinction. Texas says it joined the union because slavery would exist forever in Texas. And because Lincoln's elected, they're getting out of this union. So it was easier for me to write about Tawney, and it was easier for me to write about Story. But then I had to write about Chief Justice John Marshall. And that proved to be a problem for a while. Every biography of John Marshall essentially said the same thing. The biographer said that John Marshall owned very few slaves, that he didn't like slavery, that he heard very few cases on slavery, and he went along with slavery because it was part of the country, and they would say he went along with slavery in his personal life, because he owned a big house in Richmond and he needed servants. And in those days, the only servants you could get were slaves. Uh, one can understand the need for servants in a upper middle class or even middle class household, or in Marshall's case, a wealthy household in the 19th century. There's no electricity, there's no running water, there's no indoor plumbing, there's no refrigeration. Running the house is very, very labor intensive. And in Richmond, it would have been hard to find people to help you run your household without owning slaves. So all of the biographers of Marshall said the same thing. They all said he had a dozen house servants in Richmond. Now, actually, a dozen house servants was a lot. A dozen slaves would be uh, something close to a million dollars today. And so Marshall is hardly a, a small slave owner in the sense that he owns a dozen slaves in Richmond, Virginia. 
And so I struggled for a while on how to deal with John Marshall. What could I say about him? The biographers also said that John Marshall was very kind to his slaves, and they all pointed to a codicil in his will. Now, a codicil is something that you add to the will. After you've written the will, and you say, oh, I want to change one thing, I'm adding something. So that's in addition to the will. And the codicil to the will added just a couple of years before Marshall dies, says that it is his fondest wish that his slave Robin should be free if Robin chooses to be free. Um, now, and all of the biographers said that this shows that Marshall was a humanitarian slave owner. And I had read about this in the biographies, but I hadn't thought much about it. And then I reread a biography where it said that he would be free if he chose to take freedom. And I thought, well, why wouldn't a slave choose to take freedom? And that led me to go back to the will and not just read the codicil as most of the um, biographers had done, but actually look at the whole will. So the codicil was interesting. The codicil said, it's my fondest wish that he become free if that's what he would like. And Marshall says that if he will move to another state where free blacks can move to, like Pennsylvania or New Jersey, uh, I will give him $50. And if he will move to Liberia and Africa, I will give him $100. Um, now, $50 would have lasted a couple of months, maybe three months in those days. $100 in Liberia would have lasted a long time. But what Marshall is essentially saying is, is Robin can be free if he'll move away from everybody he knows, move away from his family, move away from his daughter, who, by the way, is also Marshall's slave, and live essentially in exile for the rest of his life. Now, Robin could have stayed in Virginia, but to do that, a local court would have had to give Robin permission to stay in Virginia. Marshall's a great lawyer. He's a very, very wealthy man. He would be, by today's standards, a multi-multi-millionaire. At one time, he owned 200,000 acres of land in Virginia. You can only imagine what 200,000 acres of land is worth. Marshall owns bank stock. He has money that he's lent out interest. He owns stock in canals. He owns stock in this new invention called the railroad. Uh, he's a shrewd businessman. He has land all over Virginia. He could easily have hired a lawyer to go into court and allow Robin to become a free resident of the state of Virginia. No judge would have denied John Marshall the right to allow his former slave to stay in Richmond. But Marshall doesn't do that. He doesn't provide any help for Robin. He simply says, Robin can be free if he wants, and if he leaves, he can get 50 bucks, but of course, Marshall knows he can't stay in Richmond, so he would have to leave. Alternatively, Marshall says that Robin can choose to be a slave of any one of Marshall's children. And in the end, Marshall remains in Virginia as the slave of Marshall's daughter. I thought about this for a while and realized I'm dealing with a very odd situation. Why would you say your slave should be free and not do something about it when you have the means to do it. I then read the rest of the will. And the rest of the will was interesting because the will began by saying, I give to my wife my slaves in Richmond. And there were actually 15 of them, uh, plus unnamed children of one of his slave women. So maybe there were 18. So the biographers all said he owned about a dozen when he owned about a dozen and a half. But you know, who's going to argue about the difference between 12 slaves and 18 slaves? Um, and this is where every person who ever wrote about John Marshall got the idea that he owned a dozen slaves in Virginia. But the problem is all of these biographers, some of whom, by the way, were my friends, and some of whom which still are my friends, failed to read the rest of the will. And so in the next provision, he says, I give to my nephew, Thomas Ambler, my land at Chickahominy, which is today suburban Richmond, uh, along with all of the slave stock plantation utensils. Now, 
a plantation is 20 slaves or more. And he says, I give to him my plantation utensils. He calls it a plantation. So I'm thinking, wait a minute, he has a dozen slaves in Richmond, and then he's got this plantation in Chickahominy. And then I read the next provision of the will, where he says, I give to my son Edward the land that he is living on with the usual number of slaves. John Marshall owned land out in uh, west of Richmond, and his son Edward lived on that land. Marshall owned the land, and Marshall owned the slaves. The next clause says, I give to my son John Jr. the land he lives on with the usual number of slaves. And it suddenly dawned on me that Marshall owns an awful lot more slaves than a dozen in Richmond. So I worked with a very good genealogist who is a graduate student at Morgan State University, um, a woman named Candace Gray. And she um, went into the census records and started poking around. And an hour or two later, she calls me and she says, John Marshall owns 65 slaves at Chickahominy. There are 27 slaves on Edward Marshall's land. There are at least 38 slaves on John Jr.'s land. And then she says, but I found three or four other parcels of land out, owned out west by John Marshall at Slave Florida. After we do all the counting, it becomes clear that John Marshall owns more than 150 slaves. It also turns out that he probably gave slaves to two or three of his older sons earlier on in his life. So that had he kept all these slaves, not given them to his son, John Marshall would have owned perhaps as many as 250 slaves in his death. This, by the way, is even more than his cousin, Thomas Jefferson. This is a huge number of slaves, but he certainly owned 150 slaves in his death. Now, that tells us something about John Marshall. It tells us something about who he is and what he does in his life. He is a major slave owner. He is somebody who is constantly acquiring slaves. And it's worth looking at John Marshall's early life. He grows up in Western Virginia. Uh, today it would be almost suburban um, Washington, D.C., but in those days it's the frontier. His father is a small slave owner, uh, owns about 18, 20 slaves uh, before the American Revolution. Uh, during the revolution, his father is a colonel in the local militia. John Marshall volunteers to fight in the Continental Army, serves with George Washington. By the way, Marshall uh, serves at, um, fights in New Jersey, he fights in Pennsylvania. He is a captain in the army when the war ends. And just before the war ends, he leaves the army, he goes to William and Mary Law School for a short time, studies a little law, reads the law, and then is admitted to the bar. And at the end of the revolution, he um, is a lawyer. He very quickly moves to Richmond, he gets into politics, he serves in the Virginia legislature. And all the while, while he's living in Richmond, John Marshall begins to acquire slaves. Now this is fascinating because he's an urban dweller. He doesn't have a lot of land. He doesn't have a farm, but he's buying slaves. Well, it turns out, of course, that he's also buying land out in Fauquier County where he is from, and he's buying other land. Uh, I wanna read from you briefly. I don't like reading from my own book, but I wanna read from you briefly just so you get a sense of the <clears throat> nature of Chief Justice John Marshall. In October 1783, Marshall bought Moses for 74 pounds. By the way, it's interesting that his record books re recall things, write things down in pounds rather than dollars. He hasn't quite switched over to the new American uh, monetary system yet. So he bought Moses for 74 pounds. Uh, on July 1st, 1784, he pays 90 pounds for Ben, another slave. Three days later, on July 4th, which is the first anniversary of American independence since the signing of the Treaty with Great Britain, 
Remember, we declare our independence on July 4th, 1776, but it's not until 1783 that the war is over and that independence has been secured. So on July 4th, 1784, the first anniversary of the American independence as no longer a colony and no longer a war, John Marshall buys two slaves for 30 pounds, uh, two young children named Eddie and Harry. He also pays 20 pounds as a down payment for two other slaves. So how does John Marshall, the soldier of the revolution, a man who fought for the liberty of the American people, how does he celebrate American liberty? By buying other human beings. In September, he pays 25 pounds for unnamed and uncounted servants. Um, in November, he buys Kate and Esau, in 1784, he buys Harry, but does not record the price. And his record books continue on like this, well into the early 1790s, constantly buying slaves. Um, in, in November 1786, he pays 50 pounds for two slaves. In April 1787, he buys Israel for 55 pounds. And in May, he pays 55 pounds for a woman bought at Gloucester. Uh, and her child. He doesn't say if the woman might have other children. He doesn't say if the woman might have a husband. He doesn't care. These are simply property. These are simply people who are used as property for John Marshall. He doesn't see them as people, though. He sees them as property. And I think uh, this is telling. This tells us something about the founding of America. It tells us something about how America is created. And sadly, it tells us something about John Marshall, who, if you ask any lawyer, if you ask any judge, if you ask any law professor, will tell you he was the greatest chief justice we ever had. And in fact, if you look at all of the writings on John Marshall, he's always called John Marshall the great chief justice. You begin to think that his first name is John and his middle name is the great chief justice and his last name is Marshall. Uh, everywhere he's the great chief justice. There's a statue of him in front of the Supreme Court building. There's another statue of him inside the Supreme Court. Uh, he has been on postage stamps. He has been on currency. There is a commemorative silver um, dollar for John Marshall. Everywhere we look, there is John Marshall. And in many ways, he's a great jurist. I, as a constitutional law professor, I would teach his cases all the time. He's very smart. He's very clever. And he is also somebody who cannot resist buying and selling human beings. And what's fascinating about the, the records of his early life, we have his account books from the early 1780s until the mid 1790s. Is it initially when he writes about buying slaves, he writes down their names. So as I said, he buys the slave Moses, he buys shoes for Hannah, he buys Eddie and Harry, he buys Cade and Esau, he buys the slave named Israel. But gradually, he stops even writing down their names. So he writes, he bought a woman, he bought a Negro man, he bought two slaves. In December, he bought uh, various um, pieces of clothing and shoes and blankets for the Negroes. He later buys shoes for the Negroes. These are people who are in his house. These are people who have names. But he doesn't talk about them as people who have names. In 1790, he records that he bought shoes for house servants. Who were these people who don't get to have names, who don't get recognized for their humanity? At one point, he says he bought blankets for Ben and Moses, uh, and he purchased Hannibal for 70 pounds, and he purchased Negro Bob for 50 pounds. Uh, but then at another point, perhaps illustrating Marshall's shifting from seeing slaves as people with names, to seeing them as mere investments, he writes in his, his financial record book that he paid 130 pounds for Dick and others. 
He doesn't say who the others are. So for some reason, Dick gets his name put in there, but nobody else does. Um, this is John Marshall. This is this young slave owner in the 1780s and the 1790s. Then he goes to France as an American envoy to the, uh, to the French government. He stays there for a year. He comes back. He runs for Congress. He serves in Congress. He then is made Secretary of State by John Adams. He serves as John Adams Secretary of State until the very end of the Adams administration. And then he is appointed Chief Justice in the United States. After he comes back from France, um, we have no record books for his buying and selling of anything. Uh, towards the end of his life, John Marshall began to burn all of his personal records. He burned all of his account books. I think he burned his account books because John Marshall did not want posterity to know how deeply involved he was in buying and selling slaves. It's not that he's embarrassed about it because he's clearly not, but rather it is an indication that Marshall knows that by the mid 1830s, significant numbers of people are beginning to condemn slavery and having a sense of history. He wants to hide his past. Fortunately for historians, he forgot about those books from the 1780s and 90s. And so those record books remained with his papers and we know something about um, John Marshall as a slave owner. And of course we have his will. And in his will, he details all of the slaves that he was giving away. After he writes his will, he rewrites it again in 1831. First time he writes it is 1827. And by this time, he's given the slaves to his son, Edward. So the will says, I give to, the, to my son, Edward, the land he lives on, the slaves having already been after he writes this will, <clears throat> his son John Jr. dies. John Jr. is sitting on land. John Jr. has in his possession at least 38 slaves. Uh, and, and by the way, 38 slaves is a couple of million dollars to, in today's money. This is an enormous amount of wealth. Marshall's son dies in great debt. Marshall's son John Jr. is an alcoholic. He is a failure. He is bankrupt a number of times. John is always bailing out John Jr. And with John Jr. having died, John Marshall has to figure out what to do with his debts. John Marshall does what a good father does, what a good grandfather does, because there are a bunch of grandchildren, what a good father-in-law does to John Jr.'s wife. He pays the debts. <clears throat> he has lots of ways of paying the debts. He can take the money out of the bank. He can sell, sell stock. He can sell land. But what does he do? He sells the slaves that John Jr. had owned. Now, you have to understand, when a slave is sold, <clears throat> that person is essentially exiled from every person that that person knows. The slave is sent away. The slave doesn't get to send emails to his or her family. You don't get to FaceTime with your children or your parents or your former husband or your former wife if you've been sold away. You are simply gone. The cruelest thing a slave owner could do was to sell a slave away from all of the people that the slave knew. The 19th century is a rough century. Slaves are whipped, but by the way, so are sailors, so are soldiers. Uh, flogging is common in the United States Navy um, until the uh, mid 1830s when it is finally abolished. Um, <clears throat> and uh, whipping of soldiers is common until the 1820s at least. Uh, it's a rough century. So slaves were whipped. I'm not condoning it. I'm simply saying that it was a slavery where these things are rough. But selling people from their children, selling people from their parents, 
selling young children away from their parents. That is a level of cruelty that is hard, I think, for almost any modern person to understand. But that's what John Marshall does because his son, who was an alcoholic and a ne'er-do-well and a bankrupt, his son left debts and the debts had to be paid. He doesn't sell land. He doesn't do anything that would not have harmed people. Rather, he sells a bunch of slaves. Curiously, when he sells the slaves, he uh, he has his, one of his other sons uh, actually conduct the sale. Um, he says that that uh, my daughter-in-law will need some of these slaves as house servants. So when these slaves are up for sale, buy some of them from the auction and give them back to her. So he has the cash to sell, to, to pay for some of the debts. But rather than using the cash to pay the debts, he uses the cash to buy the slaves hiding the fact that he's actually buying these slaves for his daughter-in-law. Uh, it's a kind of an, a, we, a very weird way of behaving. I want to now turn briefly to John Marshall as a justice because he serves on the Supreme Court longer than any other chief justice. He joins the court in 1801. He dies in 1835. So for 34 years, he's Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. The biographers who all love John Marshall always said he heard very few cases involving slavery. And I took them at their word because these were good scholars and didn't think much about it. But when I started looking at the wills and started looking at all his slave owners, I thought I'd better look at his cases in a new way. And of course, with, with electronic uh, searching, it was very easy to put in a search for the database of all Supreme Court decisions to get every case where John Marshall is on the court with the word slave in it. And about 70 cases show up. This is a lot. Uh, this is essentially two a year. Now, many of them are not really about slavery. The word slave is simply in the case in some way. Uh, for example, there might be a, uh, a contested will and uh, in the list of property, it says two slaves. Well, it's not a slavery case, but slavery is in the case. And that again shows the way in which slavery is deeply part of American culture at this time. But there are a fair number of cases that directly deal with the institution of slavery. And there are two kinds of them. One are cases involving the African slave trade. Uh, the Constitution, written in 1787, says that Congress cannot prohibit the African slave trade until at least 1808. It could have gone on forever, but it can't be stopped until 1808. However, in 1794, Congress passes a law which says that while it can't stop the African slave trade, it can stop American ships from being used in the African slave trade. So if you want to bring slaves into the United States, you can't do it as an American. You have to have a foreign slave trader bring them to you. Uh, Americans who were involved in the African slave trade are violating a series of laws passed in, 18, in 1794 and another one in 1800 and then another one in 1803. Um, <clears throat> there are a number of cases involving Americans who take ships to Africa, fill them up with slaves. Usually they don't take them to the United States because the slave trade isn't actually legal in the U.S. Uh, until 1803 when South Carolina and Georgia begin to re-import, start up again importing slaves. But they take them to other slave colonies, to British colonies, to Spanish colonies, to uh, the uh, Brazil, which is a Portuguese colony, to French colonies. Uh, Americans are involved in the trade. Some of them are either sued or prosecuted for this involvement. And in every one of these cases where John Marshall writes the opinion, the slave trader gets off. John Marshall always finds a way to prevent the prosecution of slave traders. Now, this seems odd to me. 
because even if you are a slave owner, even if you are somebody who is constantly buying slaves, by the early 1800s, most Americans have decided that the slave trade itself is immoral and is wrong, and you shouldn't be involved in the African slave trade. But Marshall somehow always finds a way of protecting slave traders. In 1808, Congress bans the African slave trade. In 1821, Congress declares that the African slave trade is piracy, punishable by death. If you are an American caught in the slave trade, you can be hanged. And during the Lincoln administration, one slave trader will in fact be hanged by the federal government for violating the laws banning the African slave trade. But when Marshall hears slave trade cases, he always finds a way to avoid convicting the slave trader. He finds some technicality. I'll give you an example because it's, uh, it's a New Jersey connection. There is a man who owns a ship who leaves either New York or Perth Amboy. We're not sure which. That's the, um, that's the New Jersey connection. And sails for New Orleans. Under federal law at the time, when you leave a port, the uh, supervisor of the port will inventory what is on your ship. So if you're leaving the port with wheat from New York and some manufactured good from New Jersey and lumber from Massachusetts, the port authorities in either New York or in Perth Amboy inventory what's on the ship. And then when the ship gets to its destination, in this case, New Orleans, <clears throat> the Port Authority inventories it again. Why? To prevent smuggling, to prevent people from going out into the Atlantic Ocean and taking illegal goods and bringing them on these ships and then smuggling them into the United States and not paying import taxes. Because you don't have to pay an import tax if you bring something from New Jersey to, to Louisiana. But you have to pay an import tax if you bring something into Louisiana from another country. In addition, these inventories are done to prevent illegally bringing slaves into the United States. Because what happens is a ship from New York sails out into the Atlantic and rendezvous with a ship full of African slaves. And those ships are, slaves are then put on the ship from New York. And the ship from New York with a US flag, and therefore is not likely to be stopped and has papers which says it's going from New York to New Orleans, it doesn't appear to be involved in the African slave trade, that ship can then go to New Orleans and um, sell the slaves. So there's a case like this. The ship takes on slaves in the Atlantic, it gets to New Orleans, and um, it's prosecuted. There's a similar case like this where the slaves are brought into South Carolina. In these cases, Marshall says, we can't prosecute them because we do not know where the ship left from. Why? Because the ship didn't get a, uh, didn't clear the port authority properly. And so he says, since we don't know where it's from, these may have been American slaves that came in and so uh, we're not going to allow the prosecution. Marshall does say, you can go back and try to find this evidence, but the indictment is bad because the indictment says the ship either left Perth Amboy or left New York City, and the indictment has to choose which place it left from. So the slave trader doesn't get prosecuted, doesn't get convicted, doesn't get punished for buying and selling human beings. In a very famous case called the Antelope, a ship full of slaves, fresh from Africa, illegally brought to the New World, ends up in Savannah. The question is, what is the status of these slaves? American law clearly says that the status of slaves illegally brought into the United States is that they are free and they should be returned to Africa. The American government should 
put them on a ship, not in chains, but as free people, and take them to Liberia, where they can be uh, free people. But Marshall says, no, we're not going to do that in this case, because these slaves were brought by pirates. They were brought by people who didn't take them from Africa, and that they're actually owned by Spanish or Portuguese slave owners, and it's legal in international law to bring slaves to Cuba or to Brazil. He says that while the slave trade is an awful thing, it doesn't violate natural law. And I'm sorry, he says the slave trade does violate natural law, but he says natural law cannot be used in an American court. Natural law doesn't apply to the United States. And so we're not going to free these slaves. Rather, we're going to give them to Spanish or Portuguese businessmen who claim that they are the owners of them. The only problem with this is the U.S. statute doesn't say any of this. The U.S. statute is very clear. If you bring the slaves into the United States, they're free. You can't smuggle them in. Pirates can't smuggle them in. Uh, it's a very odd decision, and it is only explainable if you understand that John Marshall has a soft spot for slave traders. Uh, it's curious, by the way, two years later in a case involving bankruptcies, John Marshall says that New York State's bankruptcy law violates natural law, and therefore it's unconstitutional. So in a slave trade case, you can't say the slave trade violates natural law, but in a bankruptcy case, because John Marshall, of course, is, uh, is a person who lends money out, so he's concerned about bankruptcies. In a bankruptcy case, you can say bankruptcy laws violate natural law. It's inconsistent, but that's who he is when it comes to slavery. I want to talk about one more kind of case, and then I want to take questions if there are any, because I know all of you have been very, very patient. As Chief Justice, Marshall hears 14 cases involving slaves who claim to be free. They claim to be free because they were, in most of these cases, brought to the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., in violation of local law. Washington, D.C. is governed very weirdly. Half of Washington, D.C. is governed by Virginia local law and half by Maryland local law because initially half of Washington, today this the city of Alexandria, Virginia, was part of Washington, and the rest of Washington came from Maryland. So <clears throat> both Maryland and Virginia law prohibit the importation of new slaves. You can own slaves, you can sell slaves, you can buy slaves, you can export slaves, but you can't import them into the states. And so there are a dozen or so cases in which people were illegally bringing slaves into Washington, D.C. and not properly registering them. If you move into Washington, you can bring your slaves with you. But if you already live there, you can't import new slaves. And so these are cases in which people moved into Washington, D.C. and didn't register their slaves properly. Um, in a number of these cases, juries in Washington, D.C., Juries made up of white men, most of whom are probably slave owners, reach the conclusion <clears throat> that the slave is free. In one case, the jury simply says, look, he was imported by somebody who claimed to be moving to Washington. He wasn't registered. The law requires that he be registered. Furthermore, uh, it is not clear that he intended to live in Washington, in which case the move would be fraudulent. The slave is free. John Marshall, as Chief Justice, hears the case, and he writes, the act in its, in its expression is certainly ambiguous, and the one construction or the other might be admitted without doing great violence to the words which are employed. When I read this, I thought, oh, why? Marshall's going to free the slaves. It's ambiguous. We can interpret the act one way or the other. But no, Marshall turns around and says that this means that the slave remains a slave because it, it's ambiguous and I'm going to favor the slave owner, not the slave. In another case, there is a slave who is brought into Washington, registered properly, 
kept as a slave. But then it turns out some years later that the slave's mother who lives in Maryland had never legally been a slave. She was a free person who was kidnapped as a child, raised as a slave, and her children were slaves because she was a slave. But a Maryland court, all the way to the Maryland Supreme Court, rules that this woman is free. She's never been a slave. So this isn't a question of a slave claiming some right based on failing to follow the Maryland law. This is the case of kidnapping a free person and making her a slave and then making her children a slave. <clears throat> the woman had a number of children. Those in Maryland immediately became free. But those in Washington, John Davis and his siblings, were not free. Um, and so they sued for their freedom. A jury in Washington, D.C. says John Davis is free. His mother, Susan Davis, had never legally been a slave. Therefore, he cannot possibly be a slave because the only way you can be a slave in the United States is, is if your mother was a slave. John Marshall reverses the decision. John Marshall says that the owner of John Davis has no relationship to the case in Maryland because he wasn't a party to that case. And therefore, he can't lose his property because Maryland decided that John Davis's mother was a free person. One person on the court at this time is a man named Gabriel Duval. He had been Chief Justice of Maryland. In the argument before the Supreme Court, Duval openly confronts Marshall and says, this is wrong. He says, the rule in Maryland is always the same. If your mother's free, you're free. It doesn't matter how long ago you were made a slave, you've never been a slave. And so Justice Duval has the audacity to disagree with John Marshall in public. There are 14 cases like this, freedom suits, or cases involving freedom. Marshall writes the opinion in seven of them. And in every single one of these cases, the black person does not get freedom, even in a number of cases like John Davis's uh, or the slave Ben, where the juries have said the slaves are free. In one other case, another justice from South Carolina also says that the slave remains a slave. But in the other six cases, <clears throat> decided by other justices, the slaves get to be free. Now, in the modern court, we're used to dissents. We're used to judges dissenting from what the majority says. But this is very rare in the Marshall Court. John Marshall only writes six dissents in his whole life. There are a number of justices who never dissent. Gabriel Duval writes one dissent in his life, and he dissents in... Um, uh, he dissents in one of these slave cases. Actually, I take that back. He writes another, he, he dissents in another case, but doesn't write an opinion. But in one of these slave cases, he writes a very long opinion attacking Marshall. Um, when Marshall has a majority of the court behind him, he always decides in favor of the slave owner. When he doesn't have a majority of the court, he doesn't write the opinion, but he doesn't dissent because dissents are not used very often. But it's very clear that when Marshall, towards the end of his career, could no longer control the court, other justices decide in favor of freedom. Marshall never decides in favor of freedom. I would end with this. I've, I've been talking for a while now, and I would love to get questions if there are any. I would end with this. John Marshall is a man who, throughout his life, is buying and selling human he markets slaves, he buys slaves. By the way, he, he wrote a biography of George Washington. He's the first person to write a biography of George Washington. George Washington is his hero. George Washington says, after the American Revolution, somebody asks him if he ever sells slaves. He says, I do not take men to market like cattle. Washington never buys and sells people. And at the end of his life, Washington frees all of his slaves in his will. 
John Marshall never learns from George Washington. He takes men to market all the time. He buys human beings. He sells human beings. He's constantly acquiring new slaves. And I think that when he goes to the Supreme Court, he sees himself as the protector of slave owners because he is one of them. When he hears these cases like John Davis, whose mother had never been a slave, I'm sure Marshall is thinking, well, I could have bought John Davis, and then I would be in the position of losing my investment because I didn't know that John Davis's mother was actually free. And so his sympathies and his jurisprudence are always with slave owners. John Marshall was clearly a brilliant lawyer. He was a brilliant judge. There are many things he could have done to push the United States in the direction of freedom. He could have freed a few slaves in Washington, D.C. He could have rigorously enforced the African slave trade. It wouldn't have ended slavery, but it would have given the nation a push in the right direction. Instead, he always does the opposite. Um, I wrote this book a couple of years ago. As a scholar, I wrote what I felt had to be said. I didn't expect it to become a political issue. Uh, after all, we're talking about somebody from two centuries ago. But in the current environment, it has become a political issue. I find it um, fascinating that two law schools, John Marshall Law School in Chicago and Cleveland Marshall Law School in Cleveland, are contemplating changing the names of their law schools because it is so offensive to have a law school name for somebody who spent so much of his life buying and selling human beings and getting wealthy in the process. Let me end there and let me take questions if there are any. Yes, we do have one question. Uh, why do you think history looks upon Justice Marshall so kindly when it seems that he was hypocritical and behind many of his peers slash other courts morally? Um, well, one answer is, is because until I published this book, nobody knew this. And, and it, by the way, let me, let me say something about the process of writing a book. I, you start writing a book by reading what other people have said about the subject. So I read a bunch of biographies of John Marshall. They all said the same thing. You know, he owned a dozen slaves. And at the time, owning a dozen slaves was um, what rich men did in Virginia. It made him no different than any other Virginia. And of course, compared to Thomas Jefferson's 200 slaves, a dozen slaves wasn't a lot. Uh, and so I accepted what the biographer said because why would I, why would I challenge them on this? It was only after I dug into that well that I realized there's something weird going on. And by the way, when I discovered the plantation at Chickahominy and that there were 65 slaves there, which is a lot more than a dozen, I wrote to one of Marshall's biographers and I said, um, I've discovered this. What do you think? This is somebody who said he owned a dozen slaves in Richmond. And the biographer wrote back to me and he said, I was so fascinated by what you said that I went on to Ancestry.com to look for myself, which is to say he didn't believe me. He didn't want to believe me. And he came back and he said, you're wrong. He didn't own 65 slaves in Chickahominy. He only owned 62. You're counting the overseer, his wife, and his child. Okay. So I'm wrong by three. I said 65, and this was in a private communication, and it's only 62. He's wrong by 74 or more because he says he only owns a dozen. This is the mentality of some of the scholars. They dig in. They have created this myth of John Marshall, who is almost godlike. He's above normal human activity. And so we don't want to undermine his, his reputation. Um, by the way, there has been a new biography that's come out since mine, 
my book, and that biography says he owned a lot of slaves. So maybe the understanding of Marshall will change. Uh, I think that the story of John Marshall is important because it helps us understand who we are as a nation. And it also understands how we deal with our past. There's a lot of the American past that is wonderful. And there's a lot that's ugly. And you can't sweep the ugly under the rug and say it didn't happen. Uh, what you have to do is confront it. You have to talk about it. Um, I quite frankly don't care if John Marshall Law School in Chicago changes its name. I do care if John Marshall Law School has a very serious conversation about who John Marshall was. Um, we can still say he's a great chief justice. Many of his opinions are still valid understandings of the Constitution. We can still say that his work as a judge in cases not involving human liberty is very important and very valid for us. We can say that as Chief Justice, he made the Supreme Court into a co-equal branch of the legislature and the executive branch. That's all true. <clears throat> but you don't then say, let's not look at the other stuff. Let's not look at his slave jurisprudence. Let's mislead people about his slave jurisprudence because it doesn't fit into the narrative we want. And that's the issue that the American people are facing today. Uh, I hope that answers the question. <coughs> Any others? That was the only question, but she said, uh, wow, so kudos to you for bringing this to light. Well, thank you very much. Um, my book is called uh, Supreme Injustice, Slavery in the Nation's Highest Court. I hope you have it in your library. Um, uh, I suppose I should plug it. You can buy it on on Amazon or directly from Harvard University Press. Um, I try to write in a way that non-specialists can understand because I think these are important issues. And, I'm, and I thank the library for giving me the opportunity to talk about these issues to a wider audience because I think these are things that Americans have to come to terms with. It's not just historians or law professors or lawyers. It's our heritage. We need to embrace our heritage, but we need to understand what we're embracing. And where what we're embracing is ugly, we need to confront that. And we didn't need to say, okay, we can do a better job. We must do a better job. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I think that's it for today. So I think like to thank you very much, Professor Finkelman, for your time in this very informative webinar. Um, we are going to, at the end of this video, be sending out a uh, follow-up email thanking everyone for joining us today and a poll if you don't mind answering as well uh, just regarding this webinar. So if there are no further questions, I think that's it for us today. I, I will, I will, if I can add one more thing. Of course. Before, before everybody go, I, I am the, I'm the president of Gratz College, which is in Greater Philadelphia. Uh, our website is gratz.edu. And we have an annual event every year, which is normally a dinner and a fundraiser. But because of COVID, our annual event will be online on December 2nd. Uh, and it is open to anybody who wants to register for it. So I urge all to gratz.edu and register for our annual event. And here's why, because at this annual event, we will be giving an honorary degree to CNN's Jake Tapper, and I will be interviewing Jake Tapper. And I will be interviewing Jake Tapper about all of the of monumental events that are taking place right now in the United States. And uh, I invite you to watch the interview. This will not be taped. So the only time you can catch this interview if you come to Gratz College uh, online and watch it. Uh, it's free to the public. Um, and I invite all of you to, to join us there. So thank you. And thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Of course. Bye-bye. Have a good one.